of the organizers of Curacon. Thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I recognize a lot of you guys from uh, previous years and I appreciate everybody coming out. Um, I want to introduce uh, George Spielman. He is one of the uh, other organizers of Tourcon, um, kind of handles uh, a lot of our uh, speakers and things like that. So George. Stuff. Stuff. Oh, actually, a couple of things. Dietary restrictions, anybody have? Third, you know, like crazy vegan, vegetarian. One vegetarian. One vegetarian. Two vegetarians. Three vegetarians. Oh, 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 oh. Three? Just three? Okay. Uh, this hotel is really good about stuff like that, so you'll probably have like three different salad options. So we should be we should be good. Yeah, salad options, and I don't know what you people eat, so that's <laughs> what I think you eat. So. Uh, uh, Unless you eat, because uh, I eat vegetarians. That's what I think vegetarian <laughs> vegetarianism means. You know, everything I eat typically used to eat vegetables. Um, so I think that's it. We have our reception tonight. Everybody's welcome to to, to attend that. It's just an opportunity for you to meet the other attendees of the rest of, rest of the conference. And then uh, we have Saturday and Sunday with uh, dual tracks and everything else going on uh, the rest of the weekend. Um, if you need anything, if there's any issues or whatever, I'll be outside most of the time um, or, or, or walking around. So uh, please don't hesitate to come up and uh, get my attention. So, very cool. Um, I really don't have a lot more to add, but you all having a good time so far? Yeah. Uh, show of hands, how many people are here for the workshops? Got a smattering of people. Yeah. Cool. Which workshop were you in? Android? How do you like it? Cool. What were you in? Radio. Oh, uh, SDR? Yep. How, how, what do you think? Fantastic. It was absolutely awesome. I think it was better. Okay. Cool. I like that endorsement. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Let's welcome Technical Tom to the stage here who's talking about HTTPS in the real world. Okay, so as Gio said, this is HTTPS in the real world. Um, Screw-ups, trends, and outliers was the best subheading I could come up with, because we'll see a little bit of, both, of all of them. Um, my name is Tom Samstag. I also go by Technical Tom. Um, all of these slides will be available online, so don't, don't worry about writing too much down. Uh, my email address there, at neg9. And a little bit about me before I dive into it. I am a security engineer at Security Innovation. We're in Seattle, Washington and Boston, Massachusetts. We're application security primarily, doing all the normal pen tests, code review, uh, security assessments, uh, looking for good engineers all the time in both Seattle and Boston. So see me afterwards if you're interested in that. I'm also a member of the NIG-9 CTF team where we participate in quite a few CTFs and have been uh, doing quite well, if I do say so myself. Uh, and we're always looking for, for dedicated people who, who really know the ins and outs of not just these contests, but hacking in general, or just are interested in learning. So come see me afterwards if you're interested in that also. So today, we're talking about HTTPS, and it's going to be a roughly divided into three parts. The first part of the talk is going to be about servers, second part clients, and the third part is going to be a little bit more personal and directed towards you. You and everybody you know. Um, so the first part, servers. This all started back before I gave a, a shorter version of this talk this past summer at Tor Camp when I went and found a new add on to Firefox to help make it so that more of my browsing went over secure channels. And I actually have quite a few of those types of add-ons. Uh, you probably can't read it, but I think there's six of them in this list that are just related to HTTPS. And so I was all excited, I installed it, I restarted Firefox, waited for all my 150 tabs to load, and I got disappointed because so few of the, the pages that I had opened and the pages that I browse on a daily basis still weren't going over secure channels. They were still plain text. And so thinking about this a little bit more, I decided how many of these websites that I visit and that you know average 
average web browsers, you know, people who, who spend their time on the internet, wasting it, doing it at work, whatever, how many of the websites that they go to really even offer HTTPS options? So I decided that most websites can probably be broken down into one of three categories. So I decided I'd scan the web, scan the top sites on the internet, and classify them. They'd fit either into class A, which is the best, class B, which is acceptable, or class C, which is pretty bad. Class A, the best of the best. These are the sites that force you over an HTTPS uh, connection. Whether most of them aren't uh, user unfriendly enough to just not have HTTP. Most of them redirect your HTTP traffic, redirect you directly to HTTPS. There's no way that you can browse a website over an insecure channel. And a good example of this class is PayPal. Um, if you go to paypal.com, you'll be instantly redirected to HTTPS paypal.com. And nothing you can do on PayPal will ever go over an insecure channel. So that's class A. Class B is acceptable. Um, HTTPS is available, but HTTP is, is also possible. And usually these kinds of sites, they leave it up to the user. The user has to type in that extra S in the, in the URL to get the HTTPS option. Uh, and a good example of this is Google search. Uh, you can go to google.com, uh, the, the, the site works fine on an insecure channel, but if you type in HTTPS, google.com, you get the secure version. Both versions are functional, but it's really up to the user to, to make that distinction. Class C, these are the, the bad ones. Um, HTTPS is unavailable or completely unusable. And this, this has a lot of different ways that a, a website can end up in a class C. Uh, whether there's no HTTPS server running, you know, if you, if you try to connect to 443, the port that HTTPS usually operates on, you just can't connect. Or they have, their SSL configuration is not meant for public consumption, whether that means bad certificates, untrusted certificates, self-signed, testing, the certificate is issued in the name of their hosting company, um, or just if you go to it and they're smart enough to set up an HTTPS server, but their HTTPS site redirects you to the HTTP site. They obviously just don't want you to use it, and maybe that's because they have only certain uh, pages on their site that's available over HTTPS, but whatever, whatever the reason, if you try to go to HTTPS, colon slash slash the domain, it just doesn't work. And a good example of this is Yahoo. If you go to HTTPS, colon slash slash yahoo.com, you get redirected back to the insecure version. So once again, my plan was to scan the top websites and then classify them. I thought, quite simply, every website that I look at would fit pretty cleanly into these these three categories. Um, after I started my scanning, started going over analyzing the data, I realized there's there's a little bit of a, a fourth class, uh, class WTF. These are sites that just don't fit in those other categories, whether they be weird server misconfigurations. Um, some websites have an HTTP site and an HTTPS site that behave completely different. Uh, strange redirects you see Strange redirects often when you have a big corporation that has many different domains, and they weren't expecting people to hit the HTTPS site, and so it redirects somewhere completely different. Um, but overall, these are sites that just need further attention, and by, by refining my methods, I was able to, to lower this number quite a bit, but I wasn't able to eliminate it in the time that I had. So with that in mind, my process was I get a list of sites, I visit the HTTP and the HTTPS sites, this is all scripted of course, and I record the responses. I then use different tools to scan the HTTPS configuration, figure out how they've configured their <laughs> HTTPS site, if it exists, and how secure it actually is. And then I'd crunch some numbers, make some pretty graphs, and show it all to you. So before we get into the actual results, because this is a 
a survey of sites and it's a lot of statistical number crunching, I think it's really important upfront to identify the, the biases and the, the sources of error in, in the data. So reasons why the results could be too optimistic, meaning that sites appear to be more secure than they really are. Uh, the, the main one is secure logins on landing page. So in my process, I went to http colon slash slash domain.com or domain dot whatever and https domain whatever. Now some websites, when you go to their root page, you get redirected to a login page. And in some cases, that may be the only site available in a secure, over a secure channel. In, this, in that case, the website would be recorded as more secure than it really is. I want to emphasize again that my scripts didn't look anything at any pages beyond the landing page. They didn't try to log in, and they didn't look beyond, you know, at actual usage. They just looked at the landing page. And then, of course, another source of errors, bugs in my scripts. That, that's always going to be there. I tried my best to smooth out the data, but there's always going to be errors introduced. Now, reasons why the results could be more pessimistic than, than in actuality. Browsers do a lot of work trying to smooth out the user, the user uh, experience. One thing that they do is that they are really good at determining certificate chains. So if you don't know, in HTTPS, your certificate is signed by somebody who is vouching that this is an actual legit cert. And usually that person is trusted by the browsers, but sometimes it goes through intermediate companies and you have one certificate which vouches for another, which vouches for another, up until the, the topmost one that the browser implicitly trusts. And when you configure H an HTTPS site, you have to give all those intermediate certs. And a lot of people don't do that. Browsers have, have become good at caching those intermediate certs and making up for it so that the user sees a secure page when really the, the server didn't provide all the information it should have. In my scripts, I consider that an error in configuration, and most of my scripts do not uh, do any, any means to try to connect intermediate certs between the, the, the host cert and the actual signing authority. Uh, another, another reason that my scripts, my numbers, could be too pessimistic is browsers also fall back to the www subdomain. Now, I spent most of my time looking at sites without a www dot. Uh, I personally feel that that's the way the internet should go, but either way, browsers, if you try to type in, say, whatever.com, and that is unavailable, or it can't, the browser can't connect to it, the browsers often fall back and try www.whatever.com. My scripts don't do that. Uh, another source of errors is just a small uh, scanning time windows. I did the scanning over the course of about a week. If I hit a site and it's down, it's recorded as down. I don't go back and rescan everything. I tried to rescan a few that, that gave weird errors, but for the most part, that's, that's just going to be an, in, an implicit source of errors in these kind of surveys. Um, another problem is inconsistent and tem temperamental servers. Often you have servers that seem to work one minute and return completely different results the next minute. That could be caused by load balancers, ca caused by sites that are hosted in multi-locations or with cloud services. Either way, it, it, it's a source of error. And of course, bugs in my scripts. So what I did was I applied this methodology and I scanned the top 25,000 sites by Alexa data. So the top 25,000 sites that Alexa rates cleaned up the URLs, took out just the domains, and applied this process to it. And unfortunately, the class breakdown, the breakdown of what classes everything is fits into, is largely what you would expect. Class C, the worst ones, the ones that don't offer any HTTPS, make up 93% of the top 25,000 sites. I, I 
I wish I could say I was surprised, but really it's, it's what you'd expect. If you browse a lot of websites, you realize that most of it is over in secure channels. Uh, class B actually had a nice little sizable chunk, uh, 1,400 of the, the top websites, which amounts to just over 5%, 5.5% actually seem to offer an HTTPS version of their website. Class A, the best of the best, only 277. So just over 1% of the top 25,000. And these are big name sites. Most sites you would recognize or people in different areas of the world would recognize. Some of them are maybe not very popular in the US, but these are the top websites of the internet by a, a rating that is generally well accepted, Alexa data. So from there, I wanted to look a little bit more into why sites were in class C. Why were these sites just not available in an HTTPS variant? And many of the sites failed in multiple ways. So the following numbers won't add up. But download fail. This is, this is a general catch-all where if you go to HTTPS, whatever.com, you just don't get a, down, a, a download. If you ignore all SSL errors, so this could be the server is unavailable, this could be you returned a, 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 a HTTP error code, and that accounts for 69% of the class C. So 69% of the class C servers in the top 25,000 were just completely unavailable even if you ignore all certificate errors. And that makes up 16,000 sites. Uh, next reason that, that some sites were in class C is a not valid certificate. Now, a not valid certificate means that the certificate's dates don't align with uh, the current time, meaning it's either not before now or not after now. Usually those are expired certificates, uh, some of them expiring a decade ago. Uh, or more common is site name mismatch. So in the certificate, it says this certificate is valid for example.com. You get that certificate when you go to you know, mywebstore.com. That's an invalid certificate for that, for that site. And about a quarter of the Class C's also have, are, are invalid. This is in addition to the, this is in addition to the ones that just wouldn't download. So some of them would prov provide an invalid certificate and then give you a 404. So these numbers, like I said, don't add up, but a, about a quarter of them just completely not valid. Not trusted is another reason that, that a site could find itself in Class C. And what that means is that it provides a certificate and either the, the, the certificate is not signed by a trusted authority, it's self-signed, or it's signed and it just doesn't reach up to it to an implicitly trusted uh, source. Now in this testing I was using the Mozilla certificate store. This would also catch any of those websites that just didn't provide a, a complete security chain. So that was about almost 11 percent of the class C's. And the final reason that a site could find itself as a class C is a redirect. So if you go to HTTPS whatever.com and it redirects you to an insecure site, that's a class C because it is not allowing the user to browse it in a secure manner. And sites like that make up about 17% of the class C's. And that's not a small number, that's over 4,000 sites. So these are ones that potentially are using a trusted and valid certificate, but just decide not to serve up their content over HTTPS. So diving into the data a little bit more, I have all of this information about the top 25,000 sites, some of which actually support HTTPS. I wanted to, to dive a little bit more into their configurations. Now, if you know anything about HTTPS, it's built on top of SSL and TLS. It's a series of standards for, for secure communication. Started back with SSL v1 back in the Netscape days. Uh, SSL v1 is, is largely deprecated and nobody uses it. SSL v2 replaced it. 
And that's now considered pretty insecure. There have been major issues found in SSL v2. SSL v2 should not be used at all. It was replaced with SSL v3. Uh, SSL v3 had minor issues. It's still the most commonly used uh, form of SSL and TLS. But after SSL v3, uh, I think it's the IETF took over and decided that they would standardize it and conveniently enough they renamed it to TLS. It went from secure sockets layer to transport layer security and in renaming it they went from SSL v3 to TLS v1 conveniently enough. So if you have a, a web admin who doesn't know what they're talking about they'll see version 1 versus version 3. Version 1 has to be worse but that's not the case. TLS v1 replaces SSL v3. And since then, two more minor additions have been made to make TLS v1.1 and 1.2, each with minor uh, improvements over the, the previous one. Now, ideally, everybody would re be running the newest version of TLS. I wanted to look at what websites actually support. Now remember I said SSL v2 should be completely avoided. SSL v3, really we should be moving away from it. A lot of the, the advantages in TLS should be taken advantage of. So the maximum protocol that each site supports, these are for trusted and valid sites. These are the class A's and class B's. This is the maximum protocol that they support. And we see by far most of them support only up to TLS v1. That's 85% of them. And that's about what you'd expect. I mean, it, it's, a, it's been a very slow process, partially because of client support. So we can't completely blame the servers. But for the most part, most of them support up to TLS v1. But yet we still see, well, I mean, looking at the, at the bright picture, we, we see a decent portion of them support 1.1, TLS 1.1. That's 33 servers out of um, with, this is class A and class B, I don't remember the total number. And actually a decent chunk of them support TLS v1.2. This, this was actually surprising to me. And then we have a handful of them that only support up to SSL v3. That was a little disappointing, but it's a small number. So this part actually surprising in a good way. But we also have to look at the minimum protocol that they support. They may support the latest and greatest, but if a client connects to them that only with, with an older version, what, what's the attack surface look like? So for the minimum protocol, we see a large portion of them that only support down to SSL v3. And that's about what you would expect. Again, um, not too disappointing because the transition has been taking a long time. Uh, but then we see that big blue chunk there 13% of sites that are trusted and valid that support all the way down to SSL v2. Now SSL v2 should be gone. We shouldn't be able to see that at all on the internet. And yet here we have 233 sites of the top 25,000 that support down to SSL v2. So moving on from that, I started to look a little bit deeper into the cipher suites. So after you, you start to talk to a host with SSL, you then negotiate how you want to do your encryption. And what that, what that entails is the client tells the server, these are the suites of ciphers, the cipher suites that I support, and the server picks one. Now, there's a handful of those cipher suites that say, the traffic isn't going to be encrypted at all. And these are null cipher suites. And these are bad because if you think about HTTPS, the three main benefits you get with HTTPS are secrecy, integrity, and authentication. Secrecy meaning that somebody listening in can't see the traffic. It's encrypted and they can't, they can't see what's actually being said on the wire. Integrity means that somebody in the middle between you and the server can't tamper with that data. They can't change bits without without you knowing. And authentication is authentication of the server. 
meaning that this server is who I think it is. When I type in httpsgoogle.com, I know I am talking to a Google server. And if you choose a null cipher suite, that's basically saying that you don't want secrecy. And the funny thing about, about that is when people, especially lay people, think about HTTPS, the one benefit out of these three that they think of is secrecy. They think nobody can see my credit card number going over the wire. So a null cipher suite completely breaks that, that understanding. So out of all of the class A and class B sites that I saw, I only saw four trusted and valid hosts that support null cipher suites. And, but if we include www sites, so www.domain, that number goes up to 18. So 18 of the top 25,000 websites in either with or without the www subdomain support null cipher suites. So the null cipher suites are one of uh, about six different, so the, a cipher suite is made up of a few parts. It's what encryption algorithm you want to use to encrypt the data going to and from the server. It involves how you want to exchange the keys between the server and the client. And it supports, it, it specifies how you want to hash the, the, the handshake information to make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. And the null cipher suites are the ones that say the encryption part, no encryption. So it still has the, the, the advantage of checking the certificate to make sure that you're talking to who you think you're talking to. And it still has the advantage of making sure that nothing's been tampered with to and from the server, but it doesn't encrypt that data. So anybody between you and the host can read it just as if you were on a plain text connection. And that, that includes someone at your ISP, that includes somebody who is uh, on the same public Wi-Fi as yourself. Anybody can, can read that. So if you were to connect to a host with a null cipher suite, you would still, your browser would still tell you that it's a, secure, it's a secure site, and the user would have the assumption that it's secure, meaning nobody can read it. And it is a valid HTTPS session, but it's not being encrypted. So these are sites that support that, those cipher suites, those settings that have no encryption. And like I said, the top 25,000 only included 18 valid and trusted certificates. And you would think that they're somewhere near the bottom, maybe websites that, that you've never heard of. But you might be surprised because freelancer.com, mint.com, www.mint.com. How many of you and geeks that you know use Mint to track all their financial data? Now, would you be surprised to know that they have completely screwed up their HTTPS configuration so that they allow null cipher suites? And Citrix, you would imagine somebody who does what Citrix does, which is dealing with secure network communication would be able to figure this out. So there's just really just a handful of, of, null, of servers that support null cipher suites. So another class of cipher suites are anonymous ciphers. So in those three things that HTTPS really, you know, the, the three main guarantees that you get from HTTPS, anonymous cipher suites get rid of the authentication. So they may be encrypting the data to and from the server, and they may be verifying that nobody's tampered with that data, but they offer no guarantee that you're actually talking to who you think you are. And that's a lot more important than, than it may first seem, because just because you're encrypting the data to the person and nobody's tampering with it, you don't know who you're actually talking to. So if I write a message to you and seal it in an, in an envelope, Nobody can read it, and I put my special you know, tamper evidence seal. Nobody can alter it without it being known. But then I hand it to anybody to give to you. That's still valid. So anonymous cipher suites don't actually check that when you typed in google.com, you're actually talking to Google. You could be talking to someone in the middle intercepting that traffic. And it could be encrypted to them, but maybe not to Google. 
So anonymous Cypher Suites, I found 28 hosts that support anonymous Cypher Suites. And these again are hosts in class A and class B. These are trusted and valid hosts. And if we include the www subdomains, people who differentiate between a www subdomain and not, that number goes up to 87. That's a little bit more sizable of a chunk. And looking down the list, I, I, I found fewer names I recognize, but a couple that's, that stand out of, as important. Casino.com, supposedly one of the biggest online casinos. I don't know. But you would imagine that traffic to and from a casino website should be authenticated. Um, and Angry Birds, I don't know who that impacts. I don't know if they use that host to serve updates of binaries or not. But it's still a big enough firm a, that whose main business is on the web that you would expect them to, to be able to, to do this a little bit better. The next class of, I'll call it screw ups. The next class of screw ups in bad cipher suites are export ciphers. Now export ciphers are a part of the bygone era of when, at least in the US, cryptography was regulated as a weapon. And the government basically said anything that is below a certain strength is allowed to be exported. Everything above a certain strength needs to be licensed as munitions in order to export it outside of the US. So these are really the weakest forms of encryption imaginable. These are the forms of encryption that are modern day encry encryption, so they're not, you know, Caesar ciphers. They're considered modern, but they're, in, they're cif ciphers and key sizes that are so small and easy to crack that the government back in the 1990s said that it was okay for anybody in the world to have them. So if the government was okay with anybody in the world having them back then, you can imagine how strong they are against, a, say, a state trying to, trying to crack it. Now, of all of the class A and B sites, 403 trusted and valid hosts supported export cipher suites. And if we include the www subdomains again, that goes up to 1434. And we're starting to see a bigger and bigger chunk as the screw ups are bad, but maybe a little less severe. And this one has a bunch of domains. I just, I wanted to start the list and I wanted to cut it off, but I kept seeing more and more names I recognized. So mail.ru is one of the biggest web mail providers in Russia. Uh, one of the trends we'll see is a bunch of financial firms. So chase.com, rapidshare.com. You would think maybe your, your communications with rapidshare might be secure. Uh, big name in technologies, Samsung, amazon.fr, the USPS, that one, not as surprising being a government body. American Express, another financial. Bitly.com, because how many people actually communicate with their, their primary domain name, which is a .ly? That, that trusting, uh, trusting funny domain TLDs is a completely different topic. And I, like I said, I wanted to stop this list, but it keeps going on and on. TwitPick, how many websites do you visit that have TwitPicks enabled or uh, embedded in them? Verizon, Gawker. Lenovo, Barnes & Noble, Earthlink.net, yes, they're still alive. Uh, Norton.com, you would think they know a little bit more about security. Sprint.com, and it goes on and on. United, Costco, Fidelity, more financial, term, er, financial companies. Cisco.com, uh, that one speaks for itself. Uh, American Airlines Discover Card, I think we've covered most of the, the main uh, card companies. Uh, Marriott and VMware. Uh, at this point, I figured three slides was enough, and I had to stop. I, I, I could use this to fill up more of my time, but I'm not going to. So those are the, the, the really bad cipher suites that servers could support. Uh, another problem is MD5 signatures. So when I said earlier that a certificate from an HTTPS site is, is presented to the user, and it is signed by a trusted authority. That is that certificate authority saying that this site is legit. 
And the only reason you trust that this is Google's certificate is because somebody that you implicitly trust said it is, and they digitally signed it. And there are different ways that they can digitally sign it. And what, what it ultimately comes down to is them signing the, the public portion of that certificate. Now, one of the, the, the hashing algorithms that can be used in that process is MD5. It's an older hash. It's still good for some things, but in 2005, it was a very good year for academics who were looking to discredit MD5 or just, you know, break some of the, the, the security assumptions of MD5. In 2005, researchers from several different universities, several different independent people over the course of the year were able to create false certificates that, that were accepted as legit. They were able to take a real certificate that used MD5 in its signature, create a second one for the same host with a different key, which could then be served up and the browsers would trust it. So after this happened, a huge push by the internet community actually was very successful in, in, in persuading all certificate authorities to not use MD5 in their signing of certificates. They switched to, uh, to, to, to hashing algorithms that are more resistant to this type of collision, uh, whether it be SHA-1 or the bigger SHAs uh, that we're moving towards now. And I was really surprised. When I did this in my first scan, which was the top 15,000 uh, earlier in this summer, I found no sites with MD5 signatures. This time, expanding it a little bit, looking at a different time period, I found two. But I, I had to point out the individual ones because they're a little amusing. Uh, one of the, the first one that supported MD5 signatures, and remember that that means that people can create a certificate that is accepted for this host, and it's now, I mean, the last research paper I saw was 2006, whereby somebody created a certificate, a, a, a valid accepted certificate for a, an MD5 signature in under a minute on a laptop. So this is an easy task nowadays. So the first one is pagewash.com, which on their homepage says, surf anonymously and protect your privacy and security. So this is a website that proxies web browsing for the purposes of, of, of secrecy. So it has a little iframe where you're actually browsing through them and they tunnel your, your traffic so that people don't see what you're actually browsing. That's a little ironic. I thought it was humorous. The second one, I had to do a little bit, a little bit I had to pull it up on my browser, sb24.com. Turns out it's, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, Salmon Bank. It is a bank in Iran who is accepting MD5 signatures. I, nothing too surprising about it. It's just if you're going to pick two out of 25,000 that, that have this flaw, it was a pretty funny two. Um, so another problem with, with HTTPS in, as it's actually deployed is the longevity of certificates. Now, anybody who's really into securing systems know that you want to keep your certificates to a reasonable lifespan. So the certificate itself says when it's beginning to be valid and when it is no longer valid after. Those dates are hard-coded in the certificate. And when it expires, it's no longer trusted. That's one of those criteria that said that it's no longer a valid certificate. And usually you want that span to be, you know, a moderate couple years at most. Because we all know advances in cryptanalysis mean that certificates that were, that were issued five years ago may not be as secure as they were back then. And it it's comes back to that, that, that classic cryptography issue is how long is the, is the data that you're looking to secure going to be worth more than the cost to secure it? And in the case of certificates, usually you want to limit that because that's, that certificate, once it's out there, if it is compromised, you have to go through revoking, and I'm not going to get into that, but that's a whole nother mess, saying that a certificate has been compromised and is no longer to be trusted. 
So as, as a interesting little data point, the most long-lived certificates that are trusted that I found, there are two of them. They both expire February 18th. I don't know what's special about February 18th of 2020. And they're both hosting companies, large hosting companies. And I was disappointed to find out one of them was my hosting company. <laughs> it's, it's a data point. Most of them were more reasonable than that. The really interesting part that I don't have a slide for though is the non-trusted uh, sites. So these are most likely ones that aren't signed by a certificate authority. Often they're just uh, test certificates or they're not deployed on the server that they're made for. I actually had several that exposed the 2037 bug in my scripts where these certificates expired in 2040 and any number greater than 2037 is, is in 32-bit integers, a, a bug that we'll see in Unix a few, few years down the line. So yeah, there were actually non-trusted certs that don't expire for another 30-some years. No, I don't, but I can look it up later and, and get and let you know. Um, I think they were not new. Uh, they were probably 20 year certs. Uh, so, so that means that these two companies, which are hosting companies whose sole purpose is to serve websites, are saying that they trust these certificates to be unbreakable for a full 20 years. Now think back to the state of cryptography 20 years ago. And, and now you realize why that's a stupid claim to make. Now I don't know the value of what they are protecting with, the, with these certificates, but actually in, in the case of one of the, ho the, the hosting servers that I use, they use it for all of their cPanel, you know, all of their they're secure pages that, that are used for hosting websites. Now, that doesn't mean that it's invalid now. It doesn't mean that anybody has broken it. it doesn't mean that they're going to actually use it for 20 years. But it does mean that on the face of it, this certificate is good until the year 2020. So switching a little bit from... Yes, these are, these are only trusted and valid certificates. I, I, I would have to look that up, but yes, it is, it is amusing that a certificate authority was willing to sign a certificate that is good until 2020. And are they still in business? <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't vouch for that without looking up the, these the specific. These were certificates that were stolen, right? No, the, these, are, these are actual in-use certificates. So switching gears a little bit from screw-ups to what I think is one of the best relatively new technologies to, 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 to help uh, to bundle with HTTPS is HSTS. And hopefully you all know what that is, but I'm gonna assume that you don't because it's relatively new and surprisingly few people actually know. HSTS stands for HTTP Strict Transport Security. And the way I've explained this to people is that it's a way for the server to say to the client, you really want SSL TLS, trust me. So one of the problems with securing a website and one of the problems that you face as you try to secure a website is that by default, the browser goes to the insecure version. When you type in google.com, or even if you type in neglecting HSTS, when you type in paypal.com, which is a class A website, whose everything is gonna be, is gonna be uh, redirected to HTTPS. When you type in paypal.com, the first request that your browser makes goes out to the insecure web server on port 80 of paypal.com, which then says, nope, you want a HTTPS. Now, theoretically, or really not theoretically, if somebody were in man in the middle in you and they intercepted that first communication, that one is insecure. So they could redirect you to anywhere that they want. HSTS is a way 
for the server to inform the client, next time you come to this website, don't even bother going to the insecure site. You want the secure site. It's a HTTP header that is served up in the reply, strict transport security, and it tells you how long to, to, to cache this data, how long to hold on to this fact that this domain, you should skip going to the insecure one and go to the secure one. So PayPal, once you visit it that first time, you get served up this header in the response and your browser keeps a note of that saying that for, I received it at this time, it says it's good for this long, that's a year in seconds by the way. If you try to, if you type in paypal.com again, it looks it up in its internal database and it knows, oh that site served up an HSTS request, I'm not gonna go to the insecure site, go directly to HTTPS. And that gets rid of that window whereby you're vulnerable. And unfortunately, in the top 25,000 sites, however many of those were class A and B, only 12 sites served up an HSTS header. And these are ones that really should be commended for, for, for the, what they're doing to, to help promote security. So PayPal.com, actually PayPal.com is the best example because the original, one of the co-authors of the HSTS standard was one of the engineers at PayPal.com. So this is a problem that they, they actively pursued fixing. And HSTS just, I think last week was introduced as an IETF uh, RFC. So this is on its way to, towards legitimacy. Every web server, every web browser, I'm sorry, has supported HSTS for several years now. And the, the most amazing thing about HSTS is even if your browser doesn't support it, it's no loss of functionality. You, you lose nothing by adding this header to your site if you support it, HTTPS. Uh, other sites that, that support it, getfirebug.com, the, the Firebug plugin for Firefox. LastPass, which I misspelled in this slide, is a password keeping uh, website to store all of your passwords. Uh, Gandhi is a registrar and hosting provider out of France. And Stripe.com, which some of you know from their recent CTF, is a uh, payment processor. And it's kind of sad that I can fit almost half of the, the websites that I saw that support HSTS on this one slide. But really, if you run a website and you support an HTTPS version of your website, there's no reason for you not to include the HSTS header. If, if a client visits your website and they don't support HSTS, they'll just keep browsing like normal. Chances are they will support it and you'll be closing that insecurity gap. So I saved this one for, for my last real example because it's my favorite. So when you type in HTTPS, you're being extra secure. HTTPS colon slash slash mybank.com. The S is for secure. That means that you're going to a secure website, right? You type in HTTPS colon slash slash mybank.com, hit enter, the page loads, you look up in the, in the address bar and you see the green that's, and the little lock icon, you know you're secure, right? Well, when you request the HTTPS site, what if it redirects you? What if the HTTPS site redirects you to an HTTP site, which then directs you back to an HTTPS site? That right there means that all the security you gain from the system is kind of moot because it transferred you through an insecure channel. If I were man in the middle in you, I wouldn't be able to see that first, that first request. I wouldn't be able to see the response from the server that, that redirects you to an HTTP, to an HTTP insecure site, but I'd definitely be able to see the request for that HTTP site, and I could intercept that and do whatever I want with it. I could serve up malicious payloads, and I could redirect you to some other site that looks like the site you were looking for. And I couldn't believe it when, when I stumbled on these kind of mistakes. Because here, this is where a knowing user typed in HTTPS into their browser, and they ended up on a secure site. So every reasonable person would think that that entire transaction was secure. But yet, it's not the case. And some surprising people have this problem. Tumblr.com. 
how many people have requested a page from Tumblr? And how many of those people are smart enough to actually put HTTPS in it? Actually, I think they do some, uh, they, they, they restrict you to HTTPS now, but there are pages on Tumblr's domain that you can request that will redirect you through an insecure channel. PHPBB, one of the largest PHP bulletin board software uh, systems. Django Project, another web framework. This is their homepage. Now, I don't know if PHP and BB and Django Project host on their domains the downloads that, that have this problem, but if I request HTTPS djangoproject.com slash latest.zip, is it going to go through this kind of redirection? If so, how many of you will actually notice that the zip that you're downloading is from Django Project or not? How can you tell? That's a good question. I don't know. I, I could tell just by running my scripts and seeing one redirects to another redirects to another. Um, ultimately, you end up on an HTTPS site. What it really comes down to as a user is seeing what site that you end up on, making sure that it's a secure site and owned by the same people that you went to. But really, it's, it's a fundamental problem in the redirection. Um, hopefully, your download window shows what domain it's actually coming from. In the case of uh, a website that you're not viewing a page, but you're starting a download, it, it's a tough problem to solve. It just shouldn't happen. And there are more. App.net. Uh, they made a lot of news lately about a social networking, sharing, Twitter, clone, I don't know, that, that supposedly more secure, ad-free, whatever. Another popular website. <laughs> and overall, 35 websites that have trusted and valid certificates is, have this problem. And I wish I could end there, but then I did the same thing that I did on those previous screw-ups, and I looked at the sites that offer www subdomain. And then things got really interesting. www.citybank.com, www.acrobat.com, bit.ly, or bit.ly, tdameritrade.com, Get Satisfaction. I don't know if you know what Get Satisfaction is, but it's a it's a third party uh, question and answer service that people embed in their pages. So uh, a lot of customer uh, way for customers to ask questions and be answered by the service or other users of a service. Um, but it's embedded directly in the websites that you visit. So yeah. I missed the final count, but these are people who you would hope know how to secure a website. Yet, a person who is smart enough to request an HTTPS site and ends up on an HTTPS site is redirected through an insecure channel. So with that, I'm gonna move a little bit to part two, the clients. Now, We've looked at a bunch of servers and saw a whole bunch of people who you would expect to be able to do it right screw up. And at this point, you know, I was talking to my, my coworkers about this, and when we see a, a, a customer of ours ask us to assess their web app, and we see that they support null ciphers, they get a report about it. They get told that they should not do that. They support weak ciphers, they get a report. And after this first presentation that I gave showing some of these server screw-ups, we started talking, well, with these real-world mistakes, what are the real-world implications? You know, we, we write up, a, you know, we're security people, we tell them every insecurity that they have. But it's important that we keep in mind the real ramifications of a security vulnerability. And as I said earlier, when a client first talks to an HTTPS server, they go through a cipher suite negotiation where the client 
gives a list of the Cypher suites that it supports to the server, the server picks one. So by saying that a server supports null Cypher suites, that means that a server can, is, is willing to pick a null Cypher suite from that list if presented with it. But that means nothing if no clients will offer that up as a possibility. And as we talked about it more, there existed no real way that we knew of to act, actually see what clients were willing to accept in, by way of Cypher suites. So I threw together an application, which is available now at cyphersuites.com, HTTPS cyphersuites.com. Um, and by going to it, it tests the browser that you are currently using and shows all of the Cypher suites that you offered to the server to pick from. It shows you which Cypher suite it actually chose, but it, more importantly, it shows the list of Cypher suites that the client offered. Oh, that doesn't look like it's a secure connection. Wow, well, it's cut off the, the, the URL bar. And it does this for SSL v2, v3, TLS 1, 1, 1, and 1, 2. And while this, this launched just recently, I didn't have much time to, to do an exhaustive test, I can say that I found no modern clients that support null cipher suites. So as much hand-waving as we in the security industry do about null cipher suites, no client will offer that as, a, as, an, as a, an option. Um, I, most of the desktop clients I tried do not support export cipher suites. I was a little surprised to find I think the Android default browser supports export cipher suites. Um, but I don't have real numbers yet. What I want to do is enhance this website to allow you to say what user agent you're using, voluntarily tell it to store the results and, and build up more of a profile about what clients are out there, what they support, what they don't support. But really, so this shows that clients are doing an okay job of preventing the worst of the worst. And with that, we move on to part three, you, which I've subtitled, be a class A. <laughs> so a lot of this content comes from a post on popular website, Coding Horror, from February 2012, where the person who runs the site, Jeff Atwood, he posed the question, should all web traffic be encrypted? And as it turns out, he was revisiting a topic that he, that he spoke about several months earlier. Several months earlier, he had said that it was too tinfoil hat, that it was people in the security industry are, are being overly vocal about things. And web, not all web traffic needs to be encrypted. And in the, in the process of this blog post, he goes through a process where he kind of reverses his opinion and decides that yes, maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing to encrypt all web traffic. And so I'm gonna use some of his, his, his arguments and some that I have uh, told to clients to try to convince you that if you run a website or you work for a company that has a website that it should be a class A. It should support HTTPS and should direct all users over that secure channel. So the benefits of, of serving up HTTPS are relatively obvious. Your, your users' ISPs can't snoop on their, on their uh, traffic. It prevents a fire sheep attack, a fire sheep type attack on your users, whereby maybe the login page is secure, but the rest of the traffic is passing around this session token over an insecure channel that says, I am this person who logged in, and anybody who sniffs that off the, off the, out of the air for uh, public Wi-Fi can steal the session. Other forms of public uh, Wi-Fi snooping. Remember, it doesn't have to be a, a malicious, I'm tampering with your data, I'm stealing your session. Your users, users of your website who choose to maybe naively visit your website on a public Wi-Fi, all of their transactions are visible to the people in that coffee shop. A prevent man in the middle. I mean, it, we, we keep touting that we need to protect this man in the middle scenario, protect against the man in the middle scenario. It doesn't happen all that often, but it's not a, it, it's not a invalid threat. 
and one thing that, that we like to ignore is the users that our websites may have in more hostile governments than our own. As, as much as we complain about our government's stance on cybersecurity and, and the privacy of users on the internet, there are plenty of countries in the world that have much more aggressive governments that, that the difference between an HTTP site and an HTTPS site, depending on the traffic going over it, could mean life or death. Maybe your website isn't like that, but why should that matter? Now usually when I try to tell somebody, you should be a class A, you should serve up HTTPS, you're met with one of a few counter arguments. The first one is always performance. My site's going to be so slow over HTTPS, I can't deal with this performance. The biggest counter argument, or the biggest reason why I think that that is invalid comes directly from that Coding Horror website where he talks about in January 20, 2010, Gmail changed from a opt-in a class B site to a class A site where all users were directed over HTTPS. And Adam Langley from Google on the blog post detailing this says, and I quote, in January this year, Gmail switched to using HTTPS for everything by default. Previously, it had been introduced as an option, but now all of our users use HTTPS to secure their email between their browsers and Google all the time. In order to do this, we had to deploy no additional machines and no special hardware. On our production front end machines, SSL and TLS accounts for less than 1% of the CPU load, less than 10K of memory per connection, and less than 2% of network overhead. Many people believe that SSL takes a lot of CPU time, and we hope the above numbers, public for the first time, will help to dispel that. So this is a site as big as Gmail. Imagine how many more hits Gmail gets every day than your website. Now, the performance arguments, they, they have to be tweaked for the actual user load of a website. A website that is as big as Jeff Atwood's at Coding Horror has different implications of performance than, you know, my one-off website that gets maybe one hit every week. But the, the argument that performance is a good reason to not serve it up over HTTPS is no longer valid. Moore's law has caught up with HTTPS. Another argument that I hear is, oh, it's difficult. It's hard to serve up the website over HTTPS. And I say that's, that's invalid. Uh, good reason for that is DuraConf. DuraConf is a project put out by Jacob Applebaum, who is a developer for the Tor project, and you can go on the resources for my talk and at, on GitHub, he has a collection of configuration files for IIS, Apache, all the major servers and how to secure them so that they serve up HTTPS with good Cypher suites, HSTS if possible. And these are configuration files where you could copy and paste to, to fit your needs and your site's needs. And these are hardened HTTPS configurations already written for you. In fact, I used one of them for Cypher Suites to, to help me make sure that that site is as secure as possible. Another counter example or counter argument that you keep hearing from people who are resistant to securing their website is caching. If I, if, if I serve it over HTTPS, caching won't work. Uh, I'll be dealing with so many more hits every day. And that's really not true anymore. HTTPS respects the HTTP caching directives so if your web application already serves up the headers that it needs to direct users on how to properly cache resources, it'll work over HTTPS. There may be slightly more, because, more hits because of some of the weird rules interacting with HTTPS and HTTP, but if you serve your entire website over HTTPS, caching or, or the lack of caching is no longer a valid excuse. Another example I keep hearing is, oh, SSL has insecurities. Did you hear about this attack on SSL last week? Did you hear what these researchers did to break SSL? Well, that's not valid. I mean, it, it, it's insecure compared to the plain text you're serving now. And, and what I can say about that is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you keep waiting for a perfectly sec secure solution until you give any secure solution, 
you're going to be serving up plain text till the end of the world. And and by far the biggest, the most annoying counter argument that I hear is that my website is completely public. It's all static. There's no secrets on it. There's I don't take user logins. I don't, you know, everything's freely available. And this is really annoying because not only is it common, but I actually heard these responses to when I asked academics in computer security, who I really respect, who have the word crypto in their domain name, which do not support HTTPS. And they say, well, it's, it's an academic website. All of my papers are freely available. Why should I secure it? And really the answer is HTTPS provides more than secrecy. You remember, it provides more than just the encryption link. It's a way for your users to know that they are actually talking to your server, that nobody is tampering with the data between your computer and that server. Now maybe the data going back and forth isn't secret, but if I can inject malicious script into it, if I can, if you're on Wi-Fi and I can res respond quickly to, to, to your request and you can Google it on your own time because some of the, the proof of concepts are a little less than uh, child friendly. Uh, the uh, Aeropwn, A-I-R-P-W-N attack where wirelessly you are answering other people's requests faster than the, the, the router because the router has to go out to the internet and you're sitting right here serving them malicious content. Those are all valid attacks that are prevented by using HTTPS that have nothing to do with security. So then one step ahead of that, or one step beyond that, why you should be a class A, not just a class B. There are benefits of class A. It's easier to secure HTTP cookies. So there's a little bit on, on, on cookies, little flag that you put on it saying that this cookie should only be sent to the server if, if it's a secure connection. If you offer your site over HTTPS only, you don't have to deal with whether or not that, that, that bit should be set, whether cookies should be secure or not, whether you might accidentally leak those session cookies and be vulnerable to something like Firesheet. If your entire site is secure, it's easy to, to say those cookies should also be secure. There's no juggling with li lists of important pages that should be secure. No juggling of the login page has to be secure, the change password page has to be secure, the update profile page has to be secure, but all these other ones I don't care about. Why go through that, that mix? That, that, why go through that, that bother? Uh, um, avoid mixed content errors. That's, that's a whole nother pro problem with HTTPS sites that I'm not going into because it's harder to, to automatedly scan for. But if you serve all of the resources on your website from HTTPS, then the possibility of you accidentally serving something up over HTTP goes away. And the biggest benefit is you're, you're benefiting the average user, not just the infosec professionals and the hackers who are who are privy to what it means to be HTTPS, not just the people who go into their their uh, Facebook page, dig through the settings and say, "I want the secure version," because you know those are the people who really are the the, the least likely targets to begin with. Why not help all of the people who are visiting your website, and not just the ones who know better? Because if you're relying on your users to type in HTTPS instead of HTTP, then you're only securing the people who actually know better. So conclusion of part three, be a class A. So real quickly, I want to go over a couple of resources. That's the three, the three main parts of this talk. Uh, a couple of resources that if you want to dive into this a little bit deeper, uh, you, could, you could check out these tools and websites. Uh, SSLIs is the tool that I did for most of my uh, my HTTPS server interrogation. It's by their, their description, a fast and full featured SSL scanner. Um, it's released as open source from ISEC Partners, a security firm uh, that does a lot of great work. It deprecates other tools like SSL scan and SSL test, which do similar purpose, do similar features, but um, harder to, to maintain their code bases. It's written in Python and uses a plugin model. I've written a couple plugins to help in my scanning, some of which have made it upstream, some of which haven't yet. Um, but it's really easy at code base to hack on and really get dive into and learn what it's doing, 
how it's interrogating these websites. It's available for free, open source, from their GitHub. Um, if you're a little less wanting to, to dive into it, the Qualys SSL Labs, great website, uh, great organization that is, I think it's a, it's a small part of a company uh, that is, but they're, they're actively trying to increase the HTTPS uh, usage on the internet. They have an online SSL scanner where you put in a host and it scans for all of the same stuff that, uh, that SSL eyes does, a bunch of other things, and ends up with a letter grade, A through F, on the website. How secure is, it, is its HTTPS configuration? And then it, it, it has some download links and some available information on how to increase that grade. Um, and that's at ssllabs.com. Um, so this all started with a Firefox plugin. Uh, the first one everybody in this room should have installed if you use Firefox is HTTPS Everywhere. It's a plugin by the EFF, and what it does is it, it changes Class B to Class A websites. So it has a big database of rules that says this website supports HTTP and HTTPS. Every time I see a, a URL in this form, transform it to this secure one. And it not only changes the HTTP to HTTPS, but some of these websites have really screwy ways that you have to access the HTTPS website. For example, Reddit. Reddit doesn't offer HTTPS reddit.com. You have to go through pay.reddit.com, which is the server that they usually only use for, uh, for, for payment transactions, but you can reach the rest of the website through it. Uh, HTTPS everywhere, make sure that you don't access the HTTP insecure version of these pages. So it not only turns class B to class A websites, but it also gives you the benefits associated with HSTS. And the website doesn't need to fix it. You don't have to wait for the website to fix it on their end. This is a, a, a rules-based thing that you're running locally. HTTPS Finder is another plugin for Firefox. It just, when you type in a URL, it tries the HTTPS version. If it works, it gives you that. A um, lot more finicky. You might have to deal with uh, whitelist and blacklists. Um, but it's available. It's actually the one that spawned this talk because I was hoping more sites would just work this way. Um, if you're more interested in HTTPS, the technical side of how a connection starts, the best resource I have seen yet is this blog post from this uh, on this site, Moserware, the first few milliseconds of an HTTPS connection. And he deals into the entire inter the, uh, the Cypher Suite negotiation, the, all of the crypto behind it in a very accessible way with screenshots of Wireshark, uh, best technical intro to HTTPS that I've seen. Uh, the web post uh, that I referenced should all web traffic be encrypted. Um, you can get the, get the full URL from the slides later online. Duraconf, as I mentioned, has uh, hardened config files for Apache, IIS, Nginx, PostFix, SSHD, bunch of information about setting up and securing an HTTPS uh, website and other applications. Um, and that's at, also on GitHub. Uh, before I finish up, special thanks to uh, two friends and coworkers, Meta and Seraph, who helped with uh, infrastructure. And conclusions, part one. Lots of servers have no HTTPS options, no, no support for HTTPS at all. Many of those that do are poorly configured. Part two, clients. Most browsers don't support the worst Cypher suites. Test your own at cyphersuites.com. Part three, you, be a class A. Your excuses are invalid. <laughs> Just do it. And I, I am happy to note that as the result of this talk, my employer just made the switch to a class A after it being, after the engineers have been complaining about it for several years. So being vocal about it, even if you don't have a place in the, the web administration uh, department of your company, being vocal about it and pointing out that the facts can make a difference. Thank you, my name is Tom Samstag. My email address, cyphersuites.com, will contain not only the tool to, to scan your clients, but also this slide deck. Um, I'm on Twitter. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. I have one that, uh, that I've been seeing recently uh, that's piqued my curiosity, and of course you addressed it. Uh, frequently when I'll type in uh, Google, 
google.com under uh, Firefox. It switches to an HTTPS, and then it says it doesn't have a valid certificate. So Google has a lot of weird weirdness in their HTTPS configuration. I'm not going to I'm not going to be vocal about bad mouthing Google because I wouldn't want to deal with their infrastructure because it's a little bit more complicated than the average website. Uh, I I do know that Google took a, a weird route in that they don't care about EV certificates, which is a extra validate you know enhanced validation whatever it is I don't blame them it's it's what turns the the, the little area blue but one of the uh, the side effects of an EV cert is that you can't have wildcards Google does a lot of wildcards if you look at the certificate that you get from HTTPS google.com it lists about 30 different wildcard domains um, I don't know what would cause you to see an invalid certificate, but that's a good question. If I switch over to Internet Exploder, I don't have that problem. It's just a Firefox thing. Well, one interesting thing about a trusted certificate is it all comes back to that, that top level certificate authority. And each browser has its own list of certificate authorities that it implicitly trusts. So that means that a website can be trusted in one browser and not another. So is there a way to, to trace back the certificate authority to find out where the root of trust is being broken? Yeah, uh, any one of the browsers, if you click on, uh, usually it's the area beside the address bar that has the indication that it's secure. Yeah. Um, in Firefox, it's the page information, the little security checkpoint guy. You can check on, click on that and view the certificate uh, in as raw as possible. Uh, they break it down and show you the entire certificate chain. Um, if it's something that you're actually seeing with Google, I would email Google. Um, Google is actually, for everything bad that could be said about Google, Google is really good at, at trying to push forward protocol security on the internet. And um, Adam Langley, who I quoted, is definitely one of the most vocal people about more HTTPS on the website. If you're interested in him, check out his w website at imperialviolet.org, com, something, I don't know. Google it, uh, great resource. He releases a bunch of technical information from within Google about HTTPS and his efforts to secure the internet. Um, Another thing out of Google that I, that I chose not to go into very far is Speedy. It's the new, newer protocol that they're working on trying to replace HTTP with. It's, uh, it's always encrypted. It has no option for, for a non-encrypted channel. Um, I didn't go into it because I didn't look into it very deeply, but they are pushing for this compressed, more optimized version instead of the plain text HTTP and it gives no option for, HD, for, for plain text. So, other questions? Yes? Well, this is more of a comment. Um, what you said about uh, the, making the jump from unencrypted to encrypted, not having a, uh, a large amount of overhead, that's not entirely true. That's true if you consider over the lifetime of the session, but the initial handshake is SSL handshake is where all the overhead is. It's about five to ten times what the what a unencrypted handshake is, and you're probably not going to notice unless you get a flash crowd. And so your ability to set up new sessions for new clients is going to decrease by about a quarter of magnitude. So you you may not notice, but if you're getting like the slash dot effect, that could you know your website could conceivably fall over, at least if it could like a decade ago when I used to do content to Yeah, stuff, I, I so. mean, it, encryption isn't free. Yeah. Um, that's also further mitigated by session resumption, where um, the, the expensive part is the initial handshake of SSL. Um, if you configure your server correctly, the server will give the client a, a token to then, in subsequent requests, the client gives that token to the server and it resumes the, the encrypted channel without that expensive 
handshake. Um, that's another, another thing that helps mitigate the performance impact. Yeah, it's not free, but it's, it's not as bad as most of the vocal opponents to HTTPS make it out to be, especially with mitigating factors like, uh, like session resumption and even speedy, which, which, imp which that's reduces. Why Google yeah. Work on speedy was specifically what Google gets around this problem because they have like a million servers. So yeah. So they can load balance everything. If you just have a PO and you're not load balancing, you're, you're capping the amount of customers you can handle significantly. By yeah. Doing most of us do not have the infrastructure set up of Google, yeah. um, but there are a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, technologies that might not have been around ten years ago to help mitigate those those performance issues. Not to mention servers are how much faster than they were ten years ago. Yeah, it's not free, but before you dismiss it outright for performance reasons, same thing as any developer. You got a profile. Look at the actual numbers before you say it's not worth it. Well, you know, <laughs> what you should keep in mind, though, is if you're if you're a business and you know you can handle a thousand new sessions a session uh, a second, and you migrate to this, you're going you're going that number is going to be cut down by some amount. Security is always going to be a cost benefit analysis, it, it, but it, it's important to know the actual cost before you make a decision. Another question. I saw your hand up earlier. Quick comment. Uh, I, I also quote that over talking SSL uh, and the post when I'm talking to customers about that. But there's a caveat to that post, right? Which is that half of what he does in that post about what made it fast is now no longer valid because it's gone. Right? He was using Snapstar, Fallstar, and yeah. Adam Langley extensions that are now withdrawn because they weren't secure. Um, now, I, I don't want this to make me give the impression that. Yeah, def definitely. As with all security decisions, learn all of the the costs and benefits, and 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 what the actual costs and the benefits are. Just just like it with a, every security decision. Other questions? So for um, you know, general programmers, web designers, how do they know? Well, most of these isn't about the trusted certificate authority. Um, that's a whole other discussion about which certificate authorities to trust and which not. Most of this, my presentation so far, has been about the configuration on the server. Um, once you get that certificate signed by the certificate authority, how you serve it up and how you offer to encrypt that data connection. Uh, for that, the by far the easiest way to test that is with the Qualys SSL Labs. If you own a domain, go to SSL Labs. If you support HTTPS, put your domain in there and let it scan it. See what your letter grade is. Um, I, I may not agree 100% with their algorithm to determine a letter grade, but really, for the most part, a better letter grade means that you have a more secure configuration. Any other questions? I just had a comment about the, your observation of the, the bouncing back and forth sometimes between secure and not secure. Yes. I've seen that in a couple of assessments, and it, it seems to come from uh, hard coded redirects in the application or framework. And then either they were working in a non SSL environment when they did the development. Or at some point, they said, hey, let's add SSL to the site, and the web server configuration has changed just to put a redirect on port 80 to, to uh, 443, but the application has never cleaned up to uh, force those over to SSL. Yeah, a lot, of, a, a lot of those redirects that go through an insecure channel, uh, the, the, the net effect of those two redirects is to add like www, and then another one adds you know, the default path, you know, home slash mylogin.php. Uh, but yeah, one of those redirects insecurely just says go to HTTP regardless, without taking that into consideration. Um, I don't know of an easier way to find that, rather other than my method was wget and just watch the output. Uh, your end user, they're not going to know. Any other questions?
I'll be available all weekend around the con, so feel free to come and stop me. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, everybody, lunch is going to be in Emerald, in the Emerald uh, <laughs> Ballroom. So just hook around this way. It's going to be on the other side. We were going to do it in the patio, but I guess there's weather. It's freaking them out. So uh, we'll be. There's weather, I know. Yeah, like yesterday there was like weather. There's like weather. I'm like, cool, weather. Uh, so uh, we'll be in the ballroom over there. Just uh, go ahead and migrate and help yourself. Run a little long? No, you're fine. Oh. It's noon right now. I was afraid I would finish in 20 minutes.